Hello, everyone. Welcome. I see most of you, some of you have already started introductions in the chat. So um, I want to invite everybody who is uh, has just joined. Please just uh, say hello in the chat. Let us know where you come from. Uh, tell us your name. Tell us if you're an IHS alumnus or how did you hear about this webinar. Um, we very much welcome you here today. Um, my name is Stefana Kozan. I work at IHS. I'm an alumni officer. Uh, those of you who are alumni know me from maybe previous webinars. Um, today, I welcome you to an alumni webinar, which doubles also as a book launch event, at least for the IHS alumni community. And uh, we have four wonderful speakers today. We have the editors of Streets for All. Um, that's the book that we will talk about today. That is Sham Kandekar and Vinayak, Vinayak Barney, as well as director and editorial director of the knowledge platform My Livable City. He's an urban designer, city planner, and architect with four decades of design experience in Europe and India. He was the founder and director of the award-winning Dutch design practice Kandekar Urban Design and Landscape that continued under the name of BDP Kandekar. He has lectured and published extensively on different aspects of livable cities at universities and conferences around the world. Um, under his guidance, the My Livable City platform, which is also uh, his uh, project, uh, has published three books. Um, Affordable Housing, Inclusive Cities, that was published in 2019. Um, this year, the Streets for All, 50 Ideas for Shaping Resilient Cities, uh, and also Designing for Sustainability Through Upcycling, that was published in 2020 and is authored by him. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite Shyam to um, take the word and introduce our other um, three speakers of today. The mic is yours. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Can you hear me? Please, yes, yes you can, yes. Uh, this is uh, uh, Shyam Khandeka talking from Netherlands. When you look at the three other speakers involved, so the first one I'm going to introduce is Vinayak Bharne, who is a prof adjunct professor at University of Southern California. He's a co-director. He's also my co-director at My Livable City, uh, which is a knowledge platform. And we uh, not only publish magazine and books, but also hold conferences and hold educational programs. So Vinayak has been instrumental in many of these. and. Uh, He's a, a professor of urbanism at USC, and at, next to it, he's also a practicing urban designer and architect based in the state, in the United States. But he has also been doing some work in India. Uh, then we have uh, two other prominent contributors who we invited to join the panel, who can then in the Q&A session, who will also make a short presentation. Uh, at, towards the end of the session. And then you in the Q&A section, you will be able to question them. So please pose some difficult questions to Arti Grover, who is a head of the Department of Landscape Architect, Architecture from the School of Planning and Architecture, uh, a reputed institute in, uh, from India. For those who know India know it very well. And she has 20 years of experience in research, academic work, research book on two historic streets of Delhi, which over a couple of centuries have transformed themselves. So she talks about the past and the present and how the streets transform. John Young is somebody I have had good fortune of knowing. He's from Canada, based in Canada, and uh, uh, I've had good fortune of knowing him since 1975 when we studied together at the University of Manchester. And he has been to me a visionary in many ways. Because at a time when nobody was talking about globalization and internet and all these things, this gentleman who's a planner and at the same time expert at technology could combine the two and think of where the uh, cities could go. So he's uh, one of the few people I know around the world who can understand urban planning, but at the same time understands the power of technology. And he is a co-founder and chairman of international uh, Community Forum, Intelligent Community Forum, based in the US and Canada. And he talks about the future of streets. So while Arti talks of the present that going to the, the past and coming to the present, 
John talks in his interview and his article about the future of our streets. So this is the distinguished panel. So I'm there just to help them out a little and we will carry on now uh, further with the presentation and discussion. Um, and I would like to quote, um, for those who don't know, Jan Gell is a very famous, world, uh, world famous Danish architect and urban design consultant. And in his foreword, he writes, it is my hope and wish that this book will be read by individuals across nations and multiple professional disciplines. It provides us all both inspiration and insight to elevate the livability of cities and towns across the world. So um, having agreed on this uh, very, very wide topic and the universal aspect of the book, uh, I would like to ask you when and how did you come up on the idea of writing this book? Okay. I'll, I'll take that answer. I'll, I'll try to give it. John, to before you answer, there seems to be a interruption in the sound. Many people are writing in the chat. Could we please make sure that's adjusted so we can hear you clearly? Get, is it better now when I'm speaking? Yeah, you're quite. Well, uh, for the audience, because I, I, I'm reading that uh, interruptions, people cannot hear oh. us. Are we clear? Sometimes interruptions can be due to internet of the participants okay. or inter so it depends. But if it happens to more people, please type in the chat and we will uh, try okay. to keep Thank you. Through. Sorry to interrupt. For all of those spaces where all the people, rich or poor, young and old, can take, make use of them and make cities livable. So we have always been concerned about public spaces and streets and street network are the most important part of public spaces anywhere, of any cities. In, in the world and they constitute, depending on where you are in the world, somewhere between 25 to 40% of the footprint of a city. So here you have a, an opportunity to do something to the city in a way so that it's a more equitable city, it's just to all those people who live there, particularly to, to those who are at the bottom of the pyramid. So this has been our mission of My Liberal City. So during the period when the corona hit us all, it became very clear that those cities which had more public spaces and where people could go out, and particularly those who didn't have large houses and who could go out and meet each other there and do their activities, whichever activities they were involved in, they obviously needed those public spaces. So the street network became a very important way to combat the problems of Corona in so many cities. So we thought when it had become that important but also because we thought it will make cities resilient. Streets can make, depending on how you furnish them, how you design them, how you manage them, you can make it very, uh, you can make the society and the cities very resilient. So you can do it economically by letting those people who do not have a place to work, et cetera, giving, offering them places or places to meet, et cetera, in the cities and socially. And, but you can also do it environmentally by designing it in such a way. And this book contains articles by different authors in which they talk about this resilience of cities, either environmental or social or economic in the past, but going forward, particularly in future, how one can tackle it. So this was actually the reason, uh, Stefana, why we thought this was a good moment to publish our book, concentrate our thoughts, focus them and publish this book. Thank you. I think yeah. there is a lot of interruption. If you look There's at the a chat, lot of... it's not working. We have to try and fix this before we go ahead. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what is causing it. As... Well, there's a suggestion that maybe those of us that yeah. are not talking should turn off our videos, maybe. That could be good, yeah. So maybe okay. if we're not talking, we can turn off the video. I agree. That could help. Let's try that. And... Um... Let's hope that that will work. So far, my internet is quite stable, so I'm not. I don't think that the connection is something that I can adjust uh, on my part. But let's try this way, and I hope that that can help a little bit. Um, should I then move on to the next question? Is that all right? Yes, please do. Uh, well, 
So as we understand so far, of course, and we all know public space is something ubiquitous and it's universal, but also very diverse depending on local contexts. Um, I'm curious, how does the structure of the book encompass the complexity of, of streets across the globe? How does it? Stefano, I'll take that one. Uh, if you could bring the slides, I thought it'd be nice for us to share a few slides and just uh, many of the audience members know this book by now, but those of you that do not, is the sound a little better now? Hopefully it is. Okay, well, just let us know. So I'll go quickly through what we've tried to do here. Uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to create a book on streets because there are such worthy books on streets all over, beginning with, uh, you know, books in the 60s by Bernard Rudofsky, uh, Streets for People, if you remember, and all the experiments by Donald Appleyard at Berkeley uh, resulted in wonderful morphological studies by Alan Jacobs and all of these people. And, and, and now I think we are well beyond the point that streets are conduits for cars. I think that whole idea has been shattered and we're now living in a whole different time where there's enormous advocacy all over the world, which is great news, that streets are inclusive public spaces and that's great. And it's also great that people are saying the sound is better. So that's a good thing. So what did we try to do here? Uh, the, the, the main thesis we're trying to pursue here is as a tribute to all these books and certainly to build on this enormous legacy of 50 years of looking at streets and sort of shifting the discourse and what streets mean. The only thing that made more sense to us is in, in the 21st century post-pandemic world we're living in, while the, the goal of making inclusive streets and resilient streets and streets for a climate change world, et cetera, is ubiquitous and universal, it is quite common sense, I think, to understand that because administration, governance, cultures, societal issues are so different across the world, the means and methods through which you're going to get there are going to be quite different. So it didn't make sense for Sham and me to author a book like this, but you really try and assemble a completely diverse group of people from totally different backgrounds and disciplines to make basically make the point that there are so many methods of transforming streets and bringing urban transformation which uh, change as they go from place to place. The trajectories and the methods that we're going to use to make streets for all is going to be different. And that we all have a stake in this. It is not just architects or planners or urban designers, but there are numerous projects all over the world where citizens, activists, people of all different walks of life have had enormous efforts in ways and places that many times architects do not. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, or I can do it, Stefana. Hold on. So, so what we did is, uh, the, this, we, as we gathered and solicited essays from different people, some known, some less known, but all equally talented and invested in the subject, we sort of organized them on five main structures. Uh, the first is uh, the most obvious one. The street is a receptacle for public life, but investing in streets is always a, a, a money issue. And so you have to reap return of investment. So it didn't make sense to just talk of the street as, a societal issue or a cultural issue, but really as a pragmatic issue, which is about socioeconomic development. Uh, how could you invest in streets? Just if, if one side of streets is, is shaping them as containers for public life, another one is to use them as potent tools to generate economic prosperity for everyone. The third one, of course, which is now dominant as a rubric in urban design, uh, thank God, you know, landscape architects have stepped up and reminded us that streets are ecologies, they're extended parks. Anyone who doesn't think of streets that way misses an enormous opportunity. And then you go back to the traditional idea of the street as a great urban form. You cannot miss this, but there are new ways of thinking about it. There are a lot of efforts now, not just of reviving traditions of great streets that we have lost in the past, but also thinking of streets and new kinds of urban forms for the future. So it's a both and situation. If one is the revival of the great ideas of the past, another one is looking towards the future. And finally, we end with projections of the street or what the street might become as technology comes in, as smart city initiatives take over in different parts of the world, as the issue of waste uh, and subjects that are complex and invisible really become forefront. What does the street mean as innovative infrastructure? So, so these are the five, and I'll just briefly take, to take you through some snapshots of the diversity of voices and methods that have been used in these books. For instance, we have uh, Peter Cookson Smith from, uh, many of you know his name, he's a very eminent planner and urban designer from Hong Kong. 
he has these this wonderful array of sketches that talk about, for instance, how streets in Asia, particularly South Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, have ways of forming themselves, partly through top-down methods, partly to bottom-up methods, that really talk about what Jeff Howe and others have called, you know, vertical urbanity, horizontal urbanism, or vertical urbanism, horizontal urbanity, where the two juxtapose themselves and create complex compounds that on the one hand can be regulated, but on the other hand cannot. Um, we have essays in uh, cities in the Southwest, in the, in the global South, that talk about what we call timeshare spaces and timeshare streetscapes, where the street becomes a flexible zone in the wake of uh, spatial paucity in many cities in the global south. The street is not just a conduit for cars and pedestrians and all of the good things we talk about in affluent Western nations, but it is a, it is a resource for people who simply who do not have a home to live in. And the uncanny ability of these people to occupy the street in entrepreneurial ways uh, really you know, extends the potential of streets into what they might be as spatial compounds for daily use and rituals and all kinds of wonderful things. As, as a socioeconomic catalyst, uh, this is a project I myself was involved in over the last uh, two decades. This is a modest city in uh, California that, uh, you know, through a selective investment in uh, its historic main street that had been disinvested, a one mile street is now transformed through urban design. And the city invests uh, $14 million of investment and brings back $300 million of economic development investment. So how investing in streets in your city can really raise the prosperity index. Uh, and of course, this has to be accompanied by covenants and rules to make sure that uh, local businesses are not displaced. And there's no unnecessary gentrification, et cetera. So how do we enable this is a subject of enormous importance. Uh, the idea that, uh, that streets can become event spaces, that there are tactical means of shaping streets. We have uh, a wonderful essay from Cairo, where during the pandemic, a uh, local organization, U4 Urban Impact, brought people out of their homes to create uh, temporary events on streets as an awareness uh, uh, instrument, a social exper experiment to revive both the spirit during a time when people were you know, not allowed to come out of their houses too much, but also generate an awareness of what public spaces might mean for their future. And the pandemic, of course, as Sham said, had turned the city inside out. And because the helm of the pandemic in 2020, you could not sit indoors too much. Uh, you, now public spaces of all kinds came out as the dominant sphere that would create the resilience we needed during this crisis. Uh, we then move into the street as ecology and landscape. We have every section actually begins with uh, an interview with uh, an eminent personality. I can see that Jagan Shah is with us uh, in, in the audience. I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, but we have, we, we, we thought it would be nice to, to begin the, the, to inaugurate every section with uh, a, a dialogue or a discussion with a figure that has really contributed to this rubric. So in the, in the ecology section, we brought the two very well-known figures from KU Leuven, Kelly Shannon and Bruno de Mulder, written enormous books and have, have had a wonderful, uh, a wonderful influence in terms of th rethinking what streets mean as, as landscape. Uh, we have people like Bruce, Bruce Eggberg, landscape architect from Australia, who simply elaborates on what trees mean. I mean, a subject of such beauty and profundity to just designing with trees could have such uh, enormous importance in a time today when we talk about heat islands and all kinds of incredibly important things now. And then we go into more traditional subjects, the street as urban form. Uh, and while there are numerous essays that talk about cities like Barcelona and all the wonderful street types that have been meticulously documented in other books, and so we shouldn't really talk about that. What, what this section does uh, is it really takes you beyond the West into places uh, which are less known. For example, uh, the, the idea of heritage and streets, you know, the, the shop houses of, uh, Guangzhou, uh, that, that there are numerous street types uh, that, that, that happened as amalgams of colonialism, post-colonialism, that deserve a kind of an outlook because the kind of life they foster, the rhythms they foster is quite different from conventional streets. Uh, and, and, and then finally, the idea of unconventional ways of looking at streets, an essay by Sham in this case, that goes all over the world and documents uh, bridges, which are at the same time architecture urbanism and landscape, 
uh, but done in such creative ways uh, that they are streets of a different kind. And we end the book with uh, probably a very forward-looking chapter. Uh, the street is innovative infrastructure. John Young opens this discussion with a wonderful interview that talks about what the potential of streets might be. And I think he will elaborate on this today. We then go to Hong Kong, uh, where we talk about you know, the mighty escalators of Hong Kong that connect the complex terrain in this incredibly lowland, high-rise, high-density city. How do moving streets actually enable a unique infrastructural compound that connects the city and enables it to work? Uh, what do streets mean as we rethink the asphalted right-of-way of a street in innovative ways for the future in the wake of climate change? And uh, just to, to leave you with the thought, and, and our, our esteemed panelists will talk about this further, uh, you know, the, the most important thing we've done is, uh, we, the, the, you will, as you read this book, you may find that there are voices that are often complex and contradictory even, that's exactly the point in the spirit of this book, that there's no one way of thinking of what streets will become. We all have methods we, that we've learned the hard way. And the spirit of this book is to bring an exchange in how we can teach each other and eventually make the point that the future of our world is not going to emerge as we thought 30 or 40 years ago through a dominant rubric of Western methodologies, but really methodologies that are happening through hard learned lessons in different parts of the world, not just in affluent societies, and that they both have something to teach each other, which is really common sense, but something that scholarship is just beginning to pick up over the last three or four decades. Thank you. And we can stop the PowerPoint now and take the next question. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing overview. It's, it looks like a really incredible book and I cannot wait to also read it myself. Um, I cannot help but notice how diverse um, the contributors are, how diverse the contexts are, um, and you have yeah uh, gathered a very diverse group of, of uh, voices. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the renowned professionals you interviewed for this book? I'll start that, and then Sham can take over. I I, I want to highlight two people that. Uh you know, played an enormous role in sort of sparking a very intelligent discussion that we usually don't get into. One of them is with us in the audience, Jagan Shah, who actually is the first person who appears in that book in the interview. Uh, Jagan is a very eminent name in the field of urbanism in India. He was the head of the, of the National Institute for Urbanization. He's worked with the central government and been instrumental in sort of transforming what uh, the basic tenets of uh, methodologies of how we think of urbanism in India over the last two decades has been. He's a very important figure who speaks eloquently about this. Every time I've heard him speak, I've, I've learned so much. So we decided to talk to Jagan about how, uh, in terms of public space making, which is a relatively new subject in uh, the Indian context and South, South uh, Asian context, uh, you know, where for a long time planning has become more of a, traditionally planning was kind of a bureaucratic machinery and architects sort of dominated the scene. But today, over the last five, six decades, or maybe three, four decades, if I'm more accurate, urbanism in this part of the world has really been emerging through voices like Jagan's. And so he sets the stage for reminding us that the discipline of urbanism, the discipline of public space, the idea of an ordered way of thinking about streets. But where this discussion becomes very interesting with this very intelligent professional is he doesn't miss the fact that although these kind of methodologies in street making are important for South Asian cities. We cannot afford to miss the spontaneous informality and the magical urbanism that these cities already have. So I encourage you to read this discussion because he sheds light on how he has been engaged in numerous projects that try to amalgamate this phenomena and meet both these sort of a top down method of planning and embracing the bottom up, the already existing spontaneity of these cities in ways that uh, are not very easy to negotiate. So that's one. The second one is we had a conversation with a, a very well-known professor at, the, at Tufts University in the United States, Julian Agyeman, who's written some very, very wonderful books. So one of his books that I particularly like is a book, book called uh, uh, Incomplete Streets, which is a, a fascinating tongue-in-the-cheek critique on you know this kind of cliched universal rubric of complete streets which is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, it's good and it's important, 
But, but as he points out in the book, he said, complete streets are often incomplete. And he's right, because although as urban designers, we espouse that beautiful space making, inclusiveness, the way we see it, and all the right things, but multi, multi-modality and everything will so-called create complete streets. As urban designers, we often do not get into the deeper issues of how they exacerbate sometimes the gaps between social fissures that are already existing. And I haven't seen too many urban designers, mainstream urban designers, talk about their projects into getting behind the scenes, into the legacies of how the social impacts of these projects were. We talk about the great public life that happens after it, but we really don't do enough research on it. And he points out astutely uh, how often complete streets result in sometimes uh, what he call unjust urbanism. Mm. And so he brings forth uh, caution and cautionary ideas through his projects about how the goal of great street making is eventually not just multimodality or streets for all. That's a given. It really is about social justice and really about monitoring and following through how this street is actually behaving, what it is actually doing, and constantly changing it as necessary to make sure that it is truly being a model of social justice. So, so those are two. Sham has two more that he will talk about. Uh, I, I'll talk about actually three instead of two. There are three, three more people who I have a discussion with. The first one is with Professor Kelly Shannon and Professor Bruno de Mulder of Catholic University Leuven. And this is related to the fact that uh, streets by the definition made by humans very often work as disruptors of landscape and ecology. And, uh, and they have worked as that, as that, like that. And that has not been very good, actually, for, for the natural environment, which then gets destroyed. So they talk in, in this discussion, which I have with them, about the fact that we need to look at streets as connectors also for more than human uh, elements, which, which could be nature, flora, and fauna and how to go about doing it. So that is the discussion which I have with them. Then I have a discussion in the section on urban form with Professor Ranji Sabiki, an eminent urban designer from India, probably the first professor of urban design in India, also from the School of Planning and Architecture, where Aarti Grover now teaches. And uh, he has written a book called Sense of Place. And he talks in the discussion which I have with him about also an issue with Jagan Shah, talks about, which is about how do you design for informality? Can you design at all for informality? Streets, because in India particularly, and I think global south, if we use that term, uh, informal elements in the street are very important. <clears throat> so that discussion is, uh, is, is on that. And, and how does one go about then making that possible in, in, in a lively way? Finally, in the section, the fifth section, which is just give me a minute, please. Sorry. The section <clears throat> on innovation and, and, and the future of streets, in innovative infrastructure. I have a discussion with John Young, who, I, like I, when I introduced, is a visionary in terms of where we will be going in the long term and where what technology will allow us to do and what we should allow technology to do. That is the other part of it, the ethical part, <clears throat> part of it. So in the discussion which I have with John, it's about the possibilities of new technologies and which will, the way the street will function and can function and how we can still make sure that it remains inclusive and uh, accessible to all. So these are all, ex these, these talks were exhilarating for me to also to have with these people because they have such thoughts uh, that it's 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 really a creative process discussing things with them. So these articles are there. Stefana, thank you very much for your uh, for your answers and for your examples. Uh, what strikes me in your answers is that of course the contributors are incredibly diverse, uh, which naturally reflects on the contents. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I'll, I'll, I'll take that, I'll take that. So I'll try to give you a little bit, uh, uh, some of the very diverse topics which are covered in streets. So one is, for example, I mean, I've made a, 
you, you, there are about 50 essays in that book. So you, you'll have to, I can't, obviously cannot show them all. But Kais Wolfs and, uh, and, and Flores from the Netherlands talk about how they have restructured an urban street in Eindhoven, which is the city ring, and redesigned it in such a way that it is adapted for climate change. So, so it's about looking at streets and making it adapt, adapt, adapting it for the, for the problems which climate change is going to give us. Then we have articles which, are, which talk about ecological corridors and eco ducts and, and how more than human elements also need to be catered for in streets. We have article from Malta uh, uh, from the Professor Antoine Zamit and that talks about the fact that how the government is trying to slow down the traffic in streets. So he has called that article slow streets and he's talked about the government policies which are being used there. We have an article from Netherlands from Ninka Yellis, which talks about the water streets in Netherlands, how water can be used in different ways. And actually, in Netherlands, it's used, but I'm sure in some other countries also it can be used. There's much to learn. There is an article from Sudeshna Chatterjee uh, uh, about the role of children and how we can make streets inclusive and also accessible for children. So there is a vast variety of streets, uh, different ways of looking at streets. And these articles have been written uh, by different professionals, but sometimes also by activists. So there is an article from Sao Paulo about a street, actually a concrete street raised on stilts, which was built through Sao Paulo by the military dictators and which the neighbors who lived in apartments around it appropriated for use as private, as public space for pedestrians in certain times of the day. So there are movements which it generated. So there's a vast diversity of articles from vast diversity of professionals, vast diversity of geographical locations. Vinayak, if you want to add something. No, I'll just summarize what you said, Sham. I think uh, to just distill that, <clears throat> we write this in the introduction. You know, the goal of this book was quite clear. We needed to bring diversity of three kinds <clears throat> because it was foundational to what we observed happening over the world. One, you need a geographical diversity, as Sham said, because there are just such wonderful projects happening that are stemming from the socio-political realities of different societies and nations. That's a lesson for everyone to learn from, just that exchange. So as Sham said, you know, to go from Egypt to Japan and from China to Malta, I mean, that's, that's, that was quite interesting. The second one is disciplinary diversity. The fact that the sections really elaborate on or suggest or imply that all these kinds of priorities that we give, street as urban form, street as ecology, street as infrastructure, these are different disciplinary priorities that are important. So you need professional expertise from various kinds. None of us are more important than the other. The idea that you know, urban design or urbanism is a term that you can approach from various disciplines. So that's the second one. The third diversity was the methodological diversity, that the actual ways through which you transform streets are very different. They could be bottom up, they could be top down, they could be sideways, they could be networked, they could be integrated, they could be with the government, they could be with government backing, sometimes they could be without the government's backing. All this model has constituted in wonderful examples, which is essentially what Sean is talking about. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Also in the book, um, each section ends with an illustrated essay. Um, would you like to tell us more about uh, that part? Yes, uh, Vinayak, you, you want to talk about yeah, I, 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 I can start on that. So, you know, we, Sham used a beautiful word when we were doing this book. He said, let's call these intermezzos, uh, almost like, you know, you have a symphony and then sort of a drama going on and then within between these acts is a little a little breather uh, and and we felt it was important because the essays had such density and intensity and content that we felt that it was kind of nice to uh, give a little breather in between each section but also to emphasize that unlike the so-called mainstream professional disciplines that shape streets yeah. there are numerous readings of streets that come from professionals and minds that we often underestimate. For example, painters, photographers, authors. You know, you, you, you can think of so many different ways of thinking about this. I'm going back to Qingming Shang Hatu, the 
10th century scroll that is five meters long in China that showed you know, this magnificent rendition of the <clears throat> capital of Kaifeng. It was a rendition of a street uh, and the daily life. Uh, you know, there's Hope Mirellis's poem of her, her walks. Uh, there's Charlie Chaplin's films that wanders through streets. Uh, there's Blade Runner, which happens in the sort of gloomy streets of Los Angeles. So there are different media through which readings of streets are expanded. They, they stretch our ideas of what streets can be. But what we've done is we've, we've, we've had five intermezzos, and Sham can elaborate on some of them, but I'll talk about one. I showed you the one from uh, the, the Peter Cookson Smith, who's just wonderful sketches, is a way of sort of capturing street life that often photographs cannot. That was just one way. And the second one is uh, we have this beautiful photo essay by Bruce Eckberg, where he goes around with a camera and just captures this en en encyclopedic array of trees in streets. Uh, just visual uh, ideas of capturing the, the, the simple essence of designing with one of the most beautiful things we have on earth, which is trees. But there are two or three more. Sham, yes. you should talk about. So what I would like to talk about is uh, 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 Karnasen Gupta, who has written about uh, streets in India. He has tried to create a typological atlas and taken examples from different parts and uh, sketch them very beautifully. So it's uh, and try to illustrate what those streets are trying to. It's it's about urban form basically. And uh, then we have two professionals who are from professions which are not normally related to what we discuss. And one of them is a painter, Oliver Beaven. And this is an English painter, well-known English painter who is settled in France. And uh, he talks about cities. He, he says that basically a painter is an observer and a dreamer. So you observe the city and then you dream about the city and that is his or her interpretation of the city. And Oli even makes these fantastic cityscapes and sometimes details in which you can actually see the essence of public spaces in cities. So Oli Beaver has also been very kind to provide some of the other illustrations which are also the cover of this book. Uh, and, and in the different section opener. So, so there's an interview, a discussion with him. And then finally, a very interesting photo essay by a Dutch photographer, Bas Looskoot, who has this uncanny ability to photograph people in public spaces, of the most public space, like a street, and yet capture them in their very private moments. So you can see these people, they're surrounded by different people in this city, in these streets, and yet they are really in very pensive thoughts on their own. So how can you be very private in a public space? And Das Loskos has captured these photographs. He has actually, uh, the book also talks about a book of his, in which, which is full of these photographs. So he has been very kind to also uh, let us use some of his photographs. So one of the essays is about that. I think that's the sort of diversity which we have, yes. Thank you very much. Um, well, we're nearing, uh, we're past the half of the of this event, and um, I actually want to ask you both or all, um, what are the main insights that you would summarize from this book, if you were to think of the most essential key takeaways? <laughs> well, I'll start then, and Sham can elaborate. I think the, the biggest takeaway, I think, has emerged from a lot of these conversations we've been having. Um, our biggest goal in creating this book was to simply reinforce the point that this, this sort of uh, hierarchical intellectual playing field that has existed over the last you know, century of uh, education in our field, uh, which is that the the dominant scholarship that existed in the Euro-American world that really uh, exported a lot of planning instruments to the rest of the world uh, was a good thing. And it, it uh, obviously was the starting point of a lot of things. But over the last 50, 60 years, we've learned the hard way that many other parts of the world are essentially foundationally different culturally, politically, etc. And that uh, we now need to either adapt these instruments or simultaneously, even more importantly, embrace the actual realities that we often take for granted. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, you know, in India, for instance, uh, something like religion 
plays such a prominent role in the shaping of the city. Uh, the, the idea of little, little wayside shrines is an essay that, that I myself have, have talked about in this book. Uh, wayside shrines that appear under trees and grow into temples and the temples uh, they are resilient, they, they don't go away. But conventional zoning, land use planning, all of these Western instruments that we imported have no way of engaging with these kind of informalities. So there are other methods and other ways of thinking about what the public realm means uh, that, that we often ignore. Uh, so the long story short is this book really, I hope, will help reinforce the message that this time of having a hierarchical playing field is old news. That the playing field needs to be leveled completely. That anyone in this world of technological interconnectedness that doesn't see the world as a vast canvas of knowledge that's horizontal, that's broad, a flat world, that uh, you know really has numerous experiments that are going on in different parts of the world that all have depth and wisdom to share. And that's really the most important takeaway of this book, that by learning from each other's methods and struggles and lessons, we ourselves will be able to augment and adapt our own practices in much greater ways than we could by thinking that what we've done here is the right way to do it. I'm saying this also as a mainstream urban design practitioner who works with clients, municipalities all over the world. You know, there is this attitude that making great streets will foster great public life. That's a dangerous attitude, particularly in terms of professionals. We love making beautiful streets in the optimistic, noble intention that it will foster great life. But the legacies of these streets are often far more nuanced, as many of these authors point out. And so I hope this book presents a kind of a rich canvas for us to remember that at the end of the day, this is the main takeaway for me, the methods of shaping the public realm, and by extension, shaping our cities, will actually have to emerge from the sociopolitical realities of our respective worlds. And what that means is essentially what the practice of urban design will be in those worlds. Who are the agents? Who are the actors that you must engage with and collaborate with to actually foster great change in reality far beyond the wonderful design proposals that many of us professionals like to do. Sham, give the final word. Uh, Sham, I think you're muted. Yes, yes, yes. While, while practicing, just one point, and then, then I'll come back to it in the question and Q&A if there's a chance. But I think particularly with my uh, many decades of uh, working in, on designing things in Netherlands and in India, I've noticed that issues like bylaws play a very important role in the way the interface between the public and the private. So the streets representing the public and the buildings next to it representing the private. And the bylaws are so dictatorial that we need to, as urban designers, find ways sometimes to get around it in a creative way to create good, interesting streets which are livable for all. Uh, I will. I would actually now like to close this bit, Stefana, if you're fine with it, and invite our two other panelists to make a short presentation of their chapters. Stefana? Yes. Yes. Um, I would like to then uh, invite our guest speakers, so Arti and uh, John. Maybe we can start with Arti. Um, if you would like to unmute yourself and yes. Um, Am I audible? Start the presentation, yeah. I can share the screen, right? Yeah. Let's do that. Here we go. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the landscape and urban planning of a city uh, speaks volumes about the social and cultural life that proliferated in these streets or these cities at one point of time and does even today. So with a probing eye and the basic understanding of plans, it is not impossible to speculate and reconstruct mentally these layers, drawing on how community life would have proliferated in the streets, plazas, and open spaces of that city at a certain point of time. Within these layers lie traces of many conscious and unconscious decisions of the authority that once governed the city. And these decisions and therefore their manifestations into the design provide an insight into the political aspirations, economic status and values of the older times. So my chapter in the book titled Changing Ideologies and Consequent Morphologies attempts to analyze two historic streets of significance in the city of Delhi 
Chandni Chowk and Rajpath from this standpoint. As has been mentioned elaborately by the editors that the book views the street as a simultaneously social, political, economic, uh, ecological and technical entity uh, uh, entity and how uh, really you know it uh, it is an amalgamation of all these functions at one point of time this particular chapter seeks to examine how governance and political ideologies impact the morphology of a city and how socio political dynamics plays an instrumental role in shaping up historic cities specifically within cities of heritage value uh, professionals who are already invested in uh, researching cities know that Delhi has been revered as a significant place of political and religious centrality, attracting a plethora of rulers, communities, leaders, and pilgrims all through its age. There has been a unique and unbroken succession that has been talked vividly in the chapter that I have written here. And uh, one common thread uh, between two important cities of Delhi, uh, the seventh city of Shah Janabad, and then the Lutyens Delhi, the Delhi uh, which was made by the British, is uh, the central axis that they both, uh, you know, were based on. On one hand, where On one hand, where uh, Chandni Chowk came into existence around uh, three and a half centuries ago, Rajpath was designed around one century back. So these streets are not merely streets, but were designed as grand urban axes, as I, as I said, to symbolize specific meanings in their respective settings. Now, uh, the evolutionary journey of uh, Chandni Chowk uh, from uh, when it was uh, under the Mughal and when it came to the British rule and then later by the independent Indian authority has been traced to say how uh, in different periods the form and uh, the image, the spirit of the street has kept evolving to accommodate while accommodating the uh, political wish uh, and at the same time uh, taking care of the community needs. This is uh, one part of the uh, chapter. And then it takes on to the next case study where I'm looking at Rajpath. Rajpath, which is again a very, very um, important street of, as I said, the uh, Delhi, uh, which was created by the British in around 1912 and onwards. And this axis has a great philosophical uh, uh, meaning, which has been changing along with the changing forms of the governments that we've seen over time anchoring itself between uh, executive authority on one side, as we know, and the military memory at its focal elements and along its central axis. Now, today, while we are appreciating the historicity of both these streets, yet to accommodate uh, uh, the special needs and um, uh, the political aspirations, both these heritage corridors are uh, entering a new phase of their respective life cycles, and that makes them the most appropriate cases to study, especially in this point of their new beginnings. Uh, Chandni Chowk has been reconstructed, as uh, most of us may know, especially who are um, based out of India, and Rajpath is being modified to bring to ground the latest uh, design scheme. Uh, so uh, the decisions are being taken again by the governance and are once again in the process of rewriting the codes for the social setting that will be witnessed in these spaces in the near future. Wherever they may be, the key takeaway of the chapter is that historic streets represent, comprise and contain in a very complex manner the lifestyle and cultural values of a civilization. They have many questions embedded within, the answers to which too lie in the way people use and appropriate these uh, uh, streets for celebrating and embracing life. Uh, the success, uh, you know, uh, the chapter can, kind of concludes by uh, stating that the success of contemporary landscape and urban planning surely lies in understanding and decoding this symbolism and uh, the implications are going to be far reaching in multiple ways, specifically talking about these two streets. Uh, uh, one concludes by saying that it is going to be interesting to watch if the decisions of today succeed in creating environments that are a conscious response towards historic synergy, political symbolism, and functional proficiency while being visually magnificent and candidly inclusive, which public spaces definitely should be. 
Yeah, and that's all about the chapter. Thank you very much, RD. Uh, I will now stop the slides. And um, I would like to uh, invite Mr. John Jung to take over the microphone. You. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so my name is John Young, and uh, I am an urban planner, urban designer, but I also undertook a lot of work around economic development and city development globally. Uh, and in doing so, we formed an organization called the Intelligent Community Forum, which really started off as a smart cities uh, organization. And a lot of my writing or uh, talks have been about elements of this use of technology, but not from a technology perspective, rather how it impacts communities, how it impacts individuals, their privacy, uh, their, their quality of life and so forth. So while I'm involved a lot with technology and part of what I'm gonna be talking about addresses that, particularly from the point of view of uh, streets, smart streets and so forth. Remember, uh, I'm coming at it from a different perspective, how it actually can be used by people on the street, in their community, and as part of the evolution of the uh, cityscape as we know it. So I'm gonna, I was talking in my uh, piece about the innovative street, uh, looking at it from the perspective of constant change. And of course, streets have changed from the dirt paths and the Appian Way with military garrisons and others over many, many centuries. And it's evolved into the kind of streets that we know globally, commercial streets, highways, but also these unmemorable streets, residential streets and back lanes. And many of them, particularly over COVID, uh, have been rediscovered and things have accelerated probably by at least a decade in people's thinking, planners thinking about how these streets might evolve. So this article uh, that I put in this chapter uh, looked at that evolution, particularly after COVID, and asked the question, uh, what is a good street from the point of view of the residents who live there and people who you know, want to involve the street as part of their everyday lives? So we look at the street as a constantly changing space, place, and part of an extension of their homes and businesses. You know, what a lot of these cities after COVID have been undertaking, and they've been looking at beta testing, lots of technology, uh, pilot programs of not, not only technology, but some non-technological aspects of it. And they've looked at things like Smart poles. Smart poles actually are very much a symbol of what uh, these smart streets are all about. Now, what's on these smart poles? There's everything from sensors, cameras. Uh, there are uh, various types of applications that will uh, check air quality. Uh, there might be security systems associated with it, lighting, uh, even uh, Wi-Fi mesh that can be adapted on these street poles. So these smart poles are, are one new application that's happening all around the world. Uh, they're being tested, obviously, but some are actually being implemented on a large scale, particularly from the point of view of the replacement of the lighting to LED lighting and then adding these other elements on it. Another thing was uh, the development of these waste systems. Uh, many of them using pneumatic vacuum systems like in Malmo or Almare or uh, you know, other cities, uh, Amsterdam and elsewhere, where, where they are using these to take waste and send them to energy facilities. So energy uh, being created from waste is through these systems. But more so, what has happened is these pneumatic tubes are underground. And as a result of that, uh, the servicing elements have changed. Uh, the, uh, dump trucks and garbage trucks have not necessarily been needed to go into these streets or back lanes, giving new opportunities uh, to their reuse. 
in Melbourne, for instance, some back lanes have now completely changed from being service areas to being cafes and, and outdoor eateries and entertainment areas because of these pneumatic systems or the technology of changing organic food waste and so forth into liquefied uh, um, uh, residue. And th that has been shifted off in a different way, allowing these streets to now be reused in a completely different way. Uh, control rooms are uh, being applied, like in Rio de Janeiro, so that uh, they can manage what is going on on these streets and highways from a public perspective, but also from uh, an environmental perspective. Planners have been looking at developing these new streets or reusing these streets by deploying digital twin technologies to look at the impact of these changes. Uh, the planning controls have changed. And I think this is a very important piece of it because it's not just infrastructure alone. People are beginning to look at it from infrastructure to actually new land use capabilities. Zoning the streets for new uses, uh, the opportunity for shape-shifting those streets, uh, creating opportunities that not only have been enabled by broadband, but also pneumatic systems, allowing the uh, form of the ends of the streets to become barriers or create uh, spaces that are used by the people in the neighborhoods, as opposed to uh, just by use of cars or for the storage of cars. And we see that the, this evolution is taking place in a time when people are beginning to look at electric vehicles autonomous vehicles, adapting uh, the use of robots to make deliveries on the ground or in the air through drones. And again, I mentioned these smart poles offering uh, LED lighting, but also mesh Wi-Fi capabilities into the streets uh, that become part of the neighborhood. And of course, uh, some of these streets have been used as charging systems for these electric vehicles. Uh, some streets have even adapted kinetic energy capabilities uh, as part of uh, the, the systems that they're, they're piloting. And finally, I think uh, the whole idea of creating these green streets, uh, uh, like... Um, uh, Eckbert's uh, use of trees in, in Melbourne, I think is very important as part of the evolution of creating resilient streets as well as smart streets as you evolve that kind of conversation. One thing that as an urban planner, but also as a, a, a person involved in the sort of smart cities and intelligent community movement is this focus on what all this technology is doing. Uh, we have come up with ethical smart city applications, policies, suggesting that it's really important that we have to look at these streets from an open, ethical, transparent, and accountable perspective. Uh, we cannot just in, you know, make these streets happen using technology without being sensitive to the social, cultural, and, and you know, basically, the quality of life of what these people are all about. In Toronto, we had a project called Sidewalk Labs that Google and uh, their, their company called Sidewalk uh, wanted to, uh, to build. Fantastic technology, fantastic design, but it took over people's lives from the perspective of possibly creating issues around privacy transparency and so forth. And I think at the end of the day, whatever our creative innovations are on streets, they have to be looked at from a public policy perspective, the creative arts, as well as the advances in technology. And I think that will then help transform these streets into creating a better quality of life for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John for all this extensive presentation. Just very, um, very nice to, to listen to all of you. I think right now we are
kind of nearing the end of the of the webinar. So I would like to just have a little Q&A, not so big as, as in the beginning, because I think we'll go over time, but we have time for a few questions. Uh, there is there are many comments uh, congratulating all of you. So congratulations on, on behalf of the attendees who rose. Congratulations. Congratulations, everyone, on this amazing work. Um, and then we have a few questions. Maybe whoever feels to reply can reply. Um, somebody is asking what streets or cities are taken into consideration for publishing a book of this nature uh, this person is from sri lanka and they're asking also because of with that background context in mind uh, maybe you can talk a bit about the criteria or how you chose the the, the content of the book how did you think of these cities particularly i can take that one uh, thank you and thank you for the question you know, I wish all of us had the ability of making a book that was geographically encyclopedic. I think that's an effort that would take a decade or more. So unfortunately, as we talk about is in the last paragraph of the conclusion, you know, many of us have edited numerous books. I can't think of anyone, at least that I've done, that uh, achieved the goal of being encyclopedic and thorough. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do. So I must apologize if to all of you whose geographies you missed out. Uh, the goal of this book was never to make it geographically linear or encyclopedic. You can never frame a book that way. I think books have to be framed on issues, not necessarily places. Because if you frame books on thematic issues and then you figure out some of the places that allow you to address these issues, that's a more practical way of approaching. So I, with all uh, sincere apologies to all of you whose uh, societies we might not have brought in, uh, our effort, of course, was limited in two ways. One, we had to solicit people who could write well, who could uh, you know, think in solid ways, who had enormous experience to teach us something. Uh, and so that's a limitation because you'd find these people. Uh, and, and second, whenever these people come from a particular part of the world that dominates the scene, it was our role as editors to filter them out and sort of balance it. So with... Uh, respecting due honors to the authors for the hard work contributed to the affordable develop can the authors i'm reading a question here can the authors oh i think i'm not i'm not sure i understand the question but i think the question is can the authors also talk about countries that are advancing and so uh, yes i mean if you read the book it has been our effort I hope we've been successful in it, uh, to balance sincerely uh, uh, cities and countries that are, uh, you know, teaching us ways of getting to uh, our, our, our 21st century the, 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 in ways that the, the affluent Western world has not. So there are, there are uh, a lot of essays and case studies from South Asia, from even some from, uh, from Africa, and they have enormous lessons to teach us. Thank you so much. Um, another person is asking if one of you could elaborate a bit on the streets and urban form discussion in the book. Is that something that we can do in this uh, short amount of time? Anyone? You are muted. Uh, Sean, no? uh, yeah. if, if you want to, uh, I'll take it again, but others can weigh in too. Take it well, to that. Okay. Streets, streets in urban form is a well-worn subject. Adarsh, I, this is your question, I think. Adarsh Kapoor, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one form that has received, I would argue, too much attention over the last uh, 20, 30 years, almost to the point that others have kind of become footnotes under its shadow. So what we've done is we have to give the idea of street as urban form due respect and due place. So there's an entire section on it. We talk about you know, furthering the discussion that uh, is pretty seriously vetted in other books. There is a wonderful essay in Barcelona, for example, uh, that really talks about what Barcelona is doing right now that goes far beyond the well-known streets of the Las Ramblas and all the others. But what is actually going on in these cities today that takes them far beyond the traditional lessons that these great urban rooms have taught us. So that's one. There are essays that talk about 
uh, conservation, which is a subject that really deserves a lot of attention, because while we talk about new design and new ways of thinking of urban form, the nuanced subjects of numerous urban cores all over the world that are waiting for a significant enough promise of what they will become as numerous issues related to urban form, because the forms of these streets were done in the pre-car era. So there's no way to adapt them. There are limitations on how much you can adapt them to a modern motorizing world or a post-motorizing world. So the subject of conservation looms large in the subject of urban form. Uh, and finally, there, there are essays that really talk about what urban form itself might mean in a post-climate change world. And this is where people like Bruce Eckberg and others really talk about new ways of thinking. We're designing with trees, designing with landscape as the core idea, not just as architects, but as landscape architects that are rethinking the form of the street through elements that were not traditionally the most dominant ones, uh, are some of the themes that we've tried to capture in the urban form section. Thank you so much. Um, there is another question asking, in the rapidly urbanizing developing world, isn't there the promise of leapfrogging, leapfrogging over the errors of street as motorway, streets as motorways, perhaps, since this is a very common I issue. think Sham should take this one yeah. for sure. Yeah, we, absolutely, absolutely. Unfortunately, many governments... Uh, uh, I, th I think uh, actually the, the, the field in which you see this actually has taken place is in terms in the in the uh, in the system of telephone lines. If you remember that uh, in, in many of the countries of the emerging south, uh, the the telephone lines which we used to have at at home were, weren't working very efficiently, and then the mobile telephone came, and actually in cities, uh, developing countries in Asia, but particularly in Africa, the mobile telephone suddenly has advanced so much more than many parts of the West. Where I live in the Netherlands, still people next to the mobile have their mob, that home telephone line. And this leapfrogging for infrastructure is absolutely something which we could do in the developing world. Unfortunately, many governments are not doing that. That is such a pity. So if you look at the uh, uh, the immense costs which have been made, in, let's say, in the developed world, in, in Netherlands, for example, to create the infrastructure of motorways, we shouldn't be spending that sort of money in, in countries of the developing world because that development took place over a period of many, many decades and has resulted in a situation uh, in which we actually have a... Uh, a mobility scenario which is not very friendly to this planet. So we should be looking at another way of doing things and leapfrogging this. The unfortunate thing is that this is rarely being done. That's all. But the question is absolutely your your question is absolutely right. And I think we should be leapfrogging in developing world. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um there there are more questions coming up, but we are uh almost out of time. So I will take one last question and the bonus one. There's one question that I can answer rapidly in the chat. That is where can we buy this book? I will paste a link in the chat. And the last question is um, the idea of public, spa public space as streets or, or streets as spaces with access to all appears to be in contrast to streets owned by the locality in the Indian context that needs resolution. Not sure I understand or I read this correctly, but um, if anybody. Well, this question is from uh, Professor Katie Ravindran, who's one of mm. India's most eminent urban designers. So great to thank you, Katie, for coming. Uh, and I'm not the expert on this subject as much as you are, but I'll, I'll talk about this in the context of the book. When we use the word all, uh, there's a very interesting word to think about. All necessarily can mean you know, two things. One is that it includes everybody. And one that the, the perceived ownership of his space stems from the people who actually live there. Uh, you know, that they, they actually have a stake in what these streets become. And then by extension, you have everybody else. So there are essays, I didn't talk about this enough, but there are some wonderful essays that talk about uh, local identity. Uh, particularly in the case of squatter settlements and underprivileged settlements, where how uh, a, a specific locality uh, 
begins to shape in various ways the daily identities of its streets and then how they then become places that are either selectively open to others or not itself is a decision that localities can take in their own regard. So another way of saying it is that who decides who a street is for and how it is and who will use it is not necessarily something always that needs to be decided to a top-down idea, but can be decided on the basis of a, uh, a local series of processes that some of these essays outline. I can't comment on the Indian context at all in this regard, but maybe Sham has some gems of wisdom that he may want to share. But great to see you here, Kate. Well, I, I, I think the, uh, uh, the problem, uh, one issue which we have about pub streets as public spaces in countries like India, but I'm sure this, this is applicable to some, some of the other countries where the inequality is, is very high between different parts of the society is the issue of island urbanism so that the state as it were as it were retreats and gives large chunks of land to private developers who then develop it who develop it in such a way that that piece of land and the streets in that over that piece of land are only available to those who live there so that's the issue of island urbanism and it's actually a, a really a pity that the uh, uh, that the government, uh, the, the, the city government is not taking up its role to decide the interface between the private and the public spaces and dictating the conditions which should be followed. It's, uh, it's in, in their abs absence that the developers and the builders have, to, and with the inequality which is there in these cities, that these private islands happen and these private streets take over. So it's, I, it's I just, not something I support, but that is the reality, the way it is. I, I just want to add one thing, Gary, for the Indian condition. There is There are some essays that deal with rituals and festivals. I've always felt that uh, the most beautiful bridge between local ownership and uh, streets for all, at least in India, is the, is the festivals. Because I've always marveled yes. the fact that, uh, you know, every time you have a festival and the the sort of uh, informal, the non-formal, the illegal even uh, encroachment or uh, occupation or ownership of the public domain, whether it's the Pandals during a Ganesh festival or the Narkasu refugees in Goa, which we're going to see in, this week in Diwali. Uh, I mean, these are, for me, uh, not just uh, confirmation of unique ways of how streets and public spaces work in India, but also an evidence that there is another kind of parallel governance that happens uh, that shows the power of people and the power of localities to take over these places in ways that top-down planning will never be able to engage with. So I've always been fascinated by this aspect of, uh, of cities of the global south. And I hope that we all strive to create the instruments or not the instruments by which these places, these kind of phenomena will never go away. Thank you so much, everyone. That uh, these are these are all the questions we had time for. Um, maybe as a last, uh, uh, you know, as a, a last uh, moment, maybe everyone can just turn your cameras on so we can. <laughs> I don't say goodbye alone. It is, uh, of course, a joint event. Um, it is my my sincere hope that everyone who attended today uh, really enjoyed this discussion as much as I did and uh, that you take uh, all these valuable insights along and uh, yeah to quote Jan Gell I also hope everyone reads this uh, every urban planner worldwide gets uh, their hand on this book um, and thank you so much to the speakers to the guest speakers to the participants for attending for making time on this uh, evening um, and hope to see you in a future uh, event if anyone would like to add anything please Thank you for conducting us through this uh, afternoon session, uh, Stefana. That's what I would like to say. Yes. And thank you, of course, to the other panelists. Vinayak, you want Well, I, I just want to say a few things because there was a lot of commentary. I'd like to say two or three things with respect to the audience and all the questions. Uh, I think for us, this book is not a earth shattering you know, contribution that challenges any of the books or anything. Please do not misunderstand this. Uh, I hope that's not the message. The message is it's a tribute and a, a building and updating and upgradation to all of the 
enormous legacy over the last 50 years that people have written so much about this subject, but there is so much yet to be done in the times and the issues that we face. So the idea of bringing John Young, Arti, and all these other people together was because they were doing extraordinary work in our eyes, in their own societies. And the attempt of making edited books is that you get a chance to bring these people together in one classroom, so to say, so they can share things. That's one. The, the, the most important takeaway for me as we finished this book was that design is a multifaceted word, practice of public space making, not just as something that we practice, not just as something we want to do, but that it has to engage with these two issues for absolutely the reason without which, well, absolutely the right reasons without which uh, there will be no future. So if our streets and our public spaces and the methods we use to make them better cannot engage with issues of climate change, cannot engage with poverty alleviation in our cities, then I really don't know what it is that we are doing. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to add anything? Otherwise, we can conclude here. Yeah. Yes, Thank thanks. you so much once more. And I wish you a very nice evening, day.